Good to see all who have come to worship God this morning. And uh, if you're visiting with us, then you're very welcome. We're delighted to have you here. A uh, special word of welcome to Robert. He's no stranger to us now. Robert, you're very welcome. And uh, we're delighted to have you here. Could I say, first of all, a real sincere word of thanks to everyone who made our charity concert last night such a fabulous evening. I suppose both for those who are here to enjoy it and for those who will benefit from the very generous collection that was lifted last night for haemophilia. And I thanks indeed to everyone who contributed to that. And by the way, if you're looking for a wee snack on the way home, there's still a lot of boxes left in the kitchen. So they'll be wasted if you don't. So please pick a box up in the kitchen on the way home. And you can have a wee before dinner snack on your, on your, on your, on your way home today. See so you can. I have quite a number of other announcements, so if you just bear with me for a few minutes, please. First of all, just a reminder that our shoe boxes need to be returned by next Sunday, so that's shoe boxes in by next Sunday. And then uh, the local first responders are coming along to the church hall next Saturday at 1 p.m. So we want to encourage everyone to come along and to bring your friends uh, to meet the first responders and to hear from them, because they will be telling us what to do if we ever need their help. They will also be demonstrating for us how to perform a CPR effectively and how to use a DFib. So this is very helpful and practical information. We do encourage as many to come along and make use of that. So that's next Saturday at 1 p.m. And also they are performing free health checks to farm families between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. and 30 minute slots. And if you want to book one of these slots next Saturday, all you have to do is to contact uh, Brenda Moore. Uh, Brenda's contact details are on the brochures, either in the hall or in the vestibules. You want to pick up one of those flyers on the way out and contact Brenda if you want to avail of the free health check next Saturday between 10 a.m. and 3 uh, p.m. And then the Farmer's Mission, which, as you know, is an annual event now. The Farmer's Mission will be taking place next weekend from the 8th to the 10th of November at 8.30 in Ballymena Mice Livestock Market. So that's the Farmer's Mission uh, next weekend, 8.30, 8th to the 10th uh, in the Livestock Market. And then Hope365 is an organization which works with street kids and vulnerable families in Ethiopia to rescue them from poverty and to help them rebuild their lives. Uh, as part of their fundraising activities, they collect bags of clothes and rags. And if you could help with any of these, then we would be delighted if you could bring along those to the church hall uh, on Saturday the 16th of November between 2 and 4 p.m. Or indeed, you can bring your bags and leave them in the church hall at any stage. Uh, but I believe the people are coming along at that particular time, Saturday the 16th between 2 and 4 to pick up uh, the bags. I believe, I think, that they are coming along uh, to speak at our PW. Uh, some night as well. So really, what a great opportunity, an easy opportunity to help them to raise funds for such a very worthwhile uh, task in Ethiopia. Then uh, the Farmers uh, Choir Christmas concert will be taking place on the 16th and the 17th of December in Balamina Academy, and tickets can be had from any member of the Farmers Choir. Uh, elders are reminded next Tuesday night, as usual, our prayer meeting at 8 p.m., in the upper room. And then uh, last but by no means least, our pre-communion service will be taking place on Wednesday the 13th of November at 8 p.m. here in the church. So that's pre-communion service on Wednesday the 13th of November. I think these are all the announcements. Uh, we wait on Robert to lead us in morning worship. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, it's actually good afternoon, but anyway, we're here, and I'll say good morning, and I'll say good morning at the door, even though it'll be lunchtime. But uh, it is good to be here with you, nonetheless, today to worship God as we come before him on this very special day. This is his day, the one day in seven he has set aside for us. It's lovely to be back with you again here in Newton Crumlin. Uh, it's nice that I was able to come and join with you for a while before church. Usually I landed in at 11.57 here just in, in, the, in the nick of time, but it is lovely to be here once again with you as we join round God's word together on this his day. I want to share some verses from Psalm 84 as we open our service this morning. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. My soul longs, yes, faints, 
for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. We are here today in God's dwelling place, in this house that Presbyterians have worshipped him in this area for years. And although we can't see him, we need to be really aware that he is here with us. He's present among us as we sing his praise, seek his face in prayer, and study his um, precious word later on in our service. So we are here, and our hearts are, it says in the text, our, our hearts and flesh sing for joy. And our hearts should be filled with joy. He has given us the strength to come here, to come out of our homes, and into this place to worship him on this, his day. So as we have been reading those verses, we're now going to sing them as we join together in singing verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 84. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. As we have been lifting our voices, let's now unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us all pray. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me. Father, as we have been singing the words of Scripture this morning, they ring in our ears. The truth contained within them is so very, very relevant. How lovely is thy dwelling place. Father, wherever you are is lovely. Wherever you are to be found is beautiful. You are a great God, a God who is beyond all of our praising, one who is magnificent beyond our understanding, one who we simply can't comprehend, 
with our human minds. Someone who has created heaven and earth, land and sea, the sky, and all that's in it. Placed animals, plants, countries, and nations, rivers and mountains. Father, you are a great, great God, and one who is worthy of all our adoration. One who we come humbly before on this day to praise one who we come before with the burden of our hearts, one who we come into thy presence and sing your praises, preach your word and hear the teachings of it, the one who we want to draw closer to day by day and learn more and more about, the one who we want to be like. We are created in your image, O Lord, but, Father, we strive to be more like you each and every day. Father, we come here this morning from homes, different backgrounds, different circumstances. We come here with different burdens on our hearts this morning, but we come here freely. We come here with one thing in common. We worship a risen Savior. We worship one who is here among us. We worship one who set the stars in space. And Father, as we come before you this morning, we are humbled by your awesomeness. As we come in around your word, Lord, we will learn of the great things you do. We will learn of the love you have and the bounties you bestow upon us each and every day. And Lord, we know that, we hear that week by week, that you are a great God, a, a wonderful God, a God who offers so, so much. But yet, Lord, every day, each one of us sins against you. Every day, each one of us turns our back on you. Every day, we say and think and do things we shouldn't. We falter and stumble and fall off the path which leads to you. And Lord, in your mercy, even though we are sinners, even though we repeatedly do things that are wrong, you're a God who offers great forgiveness. For even though we are condemned, Lord, even though we are filled with sin and shame, you offer each one of us a lifeline. You offer each one of us an opportunity to have all that sin taken away. All those shame, all the things, the transgressions that we commit taken away and wiped clean. You offer us atonement, Lord, forgiveness and salvation through the blood of your precious Son, who was shed, who was sent to a cross, whose blood was shed, for sinners such as us. Father, we come before you with hearts filled with thankfulness. We know that although you're not visible here, Lord, we know you're with us. And we know that the Spirit of the living God will flow around us and flow through us as we hear your word preached this morning. We pray, Lord, that you, your word will not come back untouched this morning. That as your word is preached, that as we join in this fellowship, that you will challenge each one that you will challenge our hearts, focus our minds, and settle any worries we have, and let us focus entirely on you. As we sing your praise, let the words resonate in our minds. As we seek your face in prayer, still our hearts, and then give us open and accepting minds to hear your word which is preached. We pray these things knowing that you are a forgiving and living God. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 12. I think it's 7 to, it's actually 7 to 13, but I'll read 13 and it might not be on the screen, but sure, it's only about five or six words. So I, it was my mistake. I apologize, James. I just realized that there now. So the last time I was here in September, I think you'll remember, I forgot my notes in Carnlough. And we had to change sermon just, well, I had, I didn't, I forgot, I didn't know I forgot my notes until I landed here. And then I had another note, set of notes from another sermon that I'd done at another service. So we changed to Acts. So it's wonderful how the Lord puts things in place that there was an opportunity for me to just come here today. So the people in Carnlock they're having communion this morning, so I'm here and I'm able to share with you now the, the sermon I was supposed to share with you on the 9th of September. So it's great to be able to do so. So we'll read the re reading we were supposed to read that day. Mark chapter 6, 
commencing at verse 7. This is just continuing on where we were the last time. Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. And he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. And we end our reading there and we know the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word here in this place. The last time I was here, uh, way back in, in September, we were looking at the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. And as far as I'm led to where we're still looking at the fifth commandment, so I'm not going to change that and we're going to continue on. Because the fifth commandment lends itself well to that wee passage of scripture we were reading. Question number 63 in the shorter catechism, I'm sure you will know at this stage, asks, what is the fifth commandment? And then the answer, the fifth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and thy mother. And I'm sure you have looked over the past few weeks that honoring something means more than just looking at, uh, be, obeying what they say. It means looking after them, caring for them, letting them influence you. And in this reading that we've done today in Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus sending out the 12 apostles or his disciples. And he was, in a sense, preparing them for their ministry. He was making them ready for going out to become ministers of his word. And that's something that our parents do for us and have done for us as we grew up. Our parents prepared us for numerous different things, even though we often didn't realize they were doing it. But they, in, in a sense, growing up and nurturing us, caring for us, and probably disciplining us whenever we done wrong, rebuking us and chastising us, were preparing us for the path of life that we were going to take. For instance, whenever your parents, if you're anything like my parents, forced you to eat vegetables when you didn't want to, Perhaps you're thinking, he only is making me do that because he doesn't like me. No. Or whenever they made you sit and do homework at night and you'd rather be outside feeding cows or something like that. Why is mum making me do that? Because she loves us. You know, and, and I, I, I was going to do a wee children's address about it today, but then I thought I better not because I would bring you up to the front and I would ask you, would you rather eat a salad if you stand over at that side of the room or eat a McDonald's and stand over at that side of the room? And you should all be standing over that side of the room. Would you rather sit and watch television of an evening uh, if it's wet and miserable outside, or would you rather go out and gather potatoes in the rain? You should all sit and rather watch television. Sometimes the thing that we think is what's best for us, the thing that we automatically naturally do and want to do, the easy thing is maybe not always actually the best thing. Sometimes in 2024, we, we go for convenience. We go for convenience. We look to do things that are straightforward and easy. We take the easy way. We, and so, it's a Saturday evening. I can't be bothered cooking dinner. I'll just drive into a chippy and I'll eat a fish supper. Instead, I have maybe got fish and potatoes and vegetables in the fridge, but sure, they'll maybe, they'll maybe be out of date and we'll throw them out. You know, sometimes, and, and our parents, as they brought us up, were preparing us for being independent, for being adults, for going out and facing the world that we live in. They would have been preparing us to deal with various situations. I'm sure each person here, whether your parents are, are still here with us or if they've, they're no longer with us, will have very distinct memories of advice that their parents, their fathers, their mothers, or grandparents have given them, advice that will last with them. And even in the hardest situations you find yourself in life, there's advice that our parents will have given us that will still stick by us and still stand true to us because it's so, so ingrained in our mind. And the shorter catechism tells us that we are to honor 
our father and mother. And that, in a sense, honor, that is a wide-ranging term that will mean that we are to let them prepare us. We are to embrace that preparation that they give us. And yes, our heavenly Father will prepare us as well. He is preparing us alongside. He is preparing us to come before him and ask him to be our Savior, to come and ask him into our heart. And then whenever we do that, that is the first part of the preparation. Then, as we read in our text today, he prepares us to go out and be disciples. So our parents are are preparing us for life. Our Father is preparing us to spread his word. He's preparing us to be a servant. Our, par- our parents are preparing us here on earth, but the Lord, he is preparing us for both earth and indeed for the next step, which is eternity. So that's why this fifth commandment, it is such a wide range in commandment. And you know, even though Jesus is, is encouraging and preparing his disciples, he is their father. He is their savior and he is making them ready. So if he is making us ready, which he is even today, we are to heed him and to honor him, just like it says in the fifth commandment. So thanks very much, boys and girls, for listening so well. We're going to now join together in singing our next hymn, our next congregational praise, and I knew I'd do it. I left, I, I flicked over the page here, and it's, it's as the deer pants for the water, but I just don't know what number it is, but it's only me that has to worry about the number. I think it's number 200, 488. 488, as the deer pants for the water. We join once again together in prayer. Let us all pray. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Father, as we have been singing those words, it is so true that you alone are our great protector, that you are the one who provides just, you provide the water for the animals, you provide the fields and the gardens to supply us. You're a God who is a great provider, a great benefactor. And Father, as we come before you now, we thank you for all you do. 
We thank you for all the provision for the, the food on our table, for the homes and shelters we live in, for our family and friends. Father, we thank you for our community, for the way in which we support one another as brothers and sisters in Christ in this the congregation. Father, we thank you for the concert last night. We thank you for the work that went in, for the way in which people flocked in to hear ministry through music and song. We thank you, Lord, for the work that Heather done in preparing the same. We thank you for all the, the talents that she has in, in doing that and for all the work that went in with her and the rest of the people who helped to bring this together. Lord, your name was glorified. And the people came in, Lord, perhaps even someone came in and they never would have heard your name mentioned. They would have never praised your name, but they were given that opportunity to hear your name praised, your name exalted, your name lifted higher than anything. Father, we thank you for the way we can freely do this. We pray, Lord, for this congregation for Newton Crumlin Presbyterian Church. We thank you for it. We thank you for its steadfastness, its faithfulness in serving you here in this area. We thank you for your servant here, the Reverend McGachie. We pray for him, Lord, as he ministers to the congregation in Carnlock this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with him, Lord, as he serves here and indeed in Carnlock, as he has a burden, Lord, for the people of this area, for him as he prepares his message, for as he visits the people. Lord, give him the strength, give him the the encouragement that he needs to face the different situations he finds himself in. And Father, we thank you for him and his steadfastness and his faithfulness to you and the clear message that he brings week by week. We thank you, Lord, for the session and committee of this congregation. We thank you, Lord, for the work that they do in ensuring that this congregation remains here as they look after all the various affairs that go into running a congregation week by week, month by month, year by year. They are the ones who are sort of coordinating. And we thank you, Lord, for each person who gives up of their time and talent, for each person who helps out in any way in this congregation. We thank you for them. And Father, we pray that you will be with anyone who's no, not with us this morning, for any of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering perhaps this morning with old age, infirmity, ill health, for those who would love to be here but just simply aren't able to be, for those who are perhaps at home or maybe in hospital or nursing homes, for those who even among us this morning are awaiting results or treatment or tests, for those who are going through an uncertain time with regard to their health, Father, be with them. And Lord, if they are feeling alone this morning, if they are worried or anxious regarding this, Lord, be near to them and be around them, Lord, and be all unto them that they need. Father, we see so many different types of illness, but, Lord, there are so many that are unseen. So many people carry a burden, Lord, through life in terms of mental health illnesses. And, Lord, we often forget about them because we can't see them. Just because somebody doesn't have a plaster or a cast doesn't mean that they may not be hurting. But, Lord, we are so thankful that you are a God who sees everything. And, Father, if any person be struggling with mental health issues, depression, anxiety, addiction... Father, be near to them and let them call out to you for you are a God who hears whenever we cry. Father, we understand that this can be difficult to step out in a sense and, and say, help me, Lord. But we know that you are the one who hears us. Savior, Savior, hear my mournful cry while in others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And Father, we know you won't pass us by when we call to you. Father, we pray for those who, who are affected by the devastation in Spain at the moment, for the families of those who are affected with the, the floods, Lord. There is such a, such a shock to see the news, to see so many people have been tragically killed, lost their home, lost their livelihood. Father, we pray that you'll be there. Be with those who are providing aid and relief. And Lord, be all unto them people that they need. Father, we pray for the farmer's mission which is coming up. We pray for the farming community especially. We've had a very busy summer. And Lord, we know that you're the one who is in control. But Father, whenever farmers are busy, it often leads to accidents. And this can often hurt and harm and devastate people. 
So, Lord, as people prepare for this mission, be with them as they go in. Be with them, Lord, and be with the preacher, Tom Sanderson, as he preaches a very simple gospel. And, Lord, we just pray that as people go into that, that lives will be changed, that hearts will be opened, and sin will be defeated. As your word is preached in this local area, we thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have to hear it. For we pray in the Savior's precious name. Amen. This past week, as you will know, has been midterm break, and my wife's a school teacher, so she was off in midterm. So her and I went away to Spain for a few days, well, five days, and we didn't we didn't see any rain. But the last time we were in Spain, it went well. This time it went well, but I don't speak Spanish, so it always leads to a bit of confusion. And you know, no matter how much you prepare yourself for a holiday. There's that little bit of doubt. We got into a taxi one day this week in Spain, and my wife had planned. She loves planning out where we're going to eat, and she looks up on her phone, and she says, this is a restaurant here. We'll go here because it's rated the best on TripAdvisor or whatever it is. And I say, that's okay. So I, of course, I have to speak in the taxi, and I get in, and I said, the boy said, he couldn't speak English at all, and I tried to say the name of the restaurant, and he goes, que? Like that, that's what in Spanish. Que? And I said the name of the restaurant again. K. And then I tried to explain the restaurant to him. And he said then C, which is yes. And he said, we set sail in this taxi. And we were driving and Charmaine was sitting behind me. And she says, we're going the wrong way. And I said, well, you don't, I don't know. I can't say it. So we ended up, we traveled and the taxi was twice as much as we expected it to be. And we ended up at the total wrong end of the town. And we ended up at this restaurant, which wasn't the restaurant we intended to go to. It was definitely not. And then she looked it up on the phone. And it was 51 out of 68 restaurants in the local area. So it was fairly low ranked. But I said, well, we're going in now. We've came here. We're having to go in. And we had a lovely meal. It's just funny that sometimes when you think you're, you're in diffs, and I was thinking, where, where are we going? This taxi was driving through back lanes, sort of like round here, you know, and we had no idea where we were going. But we ended up at this restaurant, which was the wrong place altogether, but we had a nice, had a nice meal. That happens regularly, doesn't it? Sometimes you think you have all this planning in place, and then just like that it goes. I had planned to come here on the 9th of September and preach on Mark chapter 6, verses 12, or 7 to 12, but then I left my books in Carnlough and I just couldn't remember the sermon word for word. So sometimes these changes happen. But the Lord is in place in everything. Sometimes even the best made plans will change. And the more preparation we do, sometimes the Lord just decides that, no, I'm going to send you a different way altogether. As we follow on from last Sunday, or it was not last Sunday, as we follow on from the last Sunday, we looked at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, the first Sunday I was here. And we will remember that Jesus got a less than favorable welcome in his hometown. He wasn't accepted. The people seen him simply as Mary's son. They, They seen that they didn't see him as a preacher. They didn't see him as a savior. He was just a local carpenter. We looked at the reaction that the people had. We looked at the reaction that Jesus had to them, and then we looked at the reaction that we must have here in 2024. And in today's lesson, which is following on directly from that, we learn about Jesus sending out his disciples to preach his word. He is preparing them as they go. Here in 2024, it can be easy for us to just sit back in church and and let the minister do all the work. But as we see from from last week's te- or the last time I was here and today's text, there is a need for us in this area as well. Perhaps not to come and preach from the pulpit, but there is a need for us to serve the Lord here in this church, in this community. The disciples were representatives of Jesus. We should be representatives of Jesus. In the fifth commandment, we are told to honor our father and our mother. We are representatives of our family. And in this text, the disciples are representatives of Jesus, and we are representatives of Jesus. At this ch- in, in our lives, in this church, at work, we are representatives of him. So the three points I want to take out of, this serv- out of this text today is, the first thing we notice is Jesus is preparing the disciples. He prepared them. 
Then secondly, Jesus presaged the disciples, which is another fancy word for warned them. And then thirdly, the disciples proclaimed God's word. From this text we've been reading, we see that Jesus is out teaching and preaching with the disciples. They are with him, but he is doing the teaching. So up to this point, Jesus would have been standing at the front and the disciples would have sort of been standing behind him like that there, like as an entourage. But this is a crucial passage of the Bible because this is the first time in all the text of the scriptures we see other people going out to minister God's word. This is the first time that others are ministering God's word as we know it today. In the Old Testament, people prophesied about Jesus. They prophesied about God's word. But this is the first time that Jesus is sending out others to minister for him. He performed miracles. He taught. And he predicted his own death. But this is the first time we see others going out to preach Jesus' gospel. And he gives them authority. It says in verse 8, he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. So Jesus is sending these men out with only the most basic provision, only the shirt on their back and the shoes on their feet. As, as we have talked about before, this the Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are sort of reflective of each other in the sense that a lot of the events which happen in one happen in the others. And this event happens in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. But in Matthew and Luke, Jesus instructs them not to take a staff for their hand, whereas in Mark's, he does, he tells them to take a staff for their hand. So just imagine in Matthew and Luke, he says, don't be taking a staff. But in Mark, he says, do take a staff. And it's believed that Mark's gospel wasn't written. It was Mark, he dictated it and somebody else wrote it. But a lot of Bible commentators basically said that the staff he takes in Mark's is only a walking stick just to help him on his way, whereas the staff he was told the people not to take was for defense. So basically what I'm trying to say in a very convoluted way is they had no way of defending themselves. They weren't even allowed to take a stick with them to fend off predators. So all they have was themselves. They only have what? was on their back and on their feet. They had nothing, and they were depending on God entirely. They couldn't depend on other people. Isn't it hard when we don't have our own resources and we have to depend on somebody else? If you're here way back in 2019 or 2020, I shared a testimony at a midweek with you, and I probably told you about the time in 2010 when I, I was part of a team that went to Romania. And one thing I remember about Romania was the food. I, I'm a very plain eater. I'm a big eater, but I'm a plain eater. And for two weeks in Romania, I survived on very basic food. But during the time I was in Romania, my 17th birthday happened, so I celebrated that in Romania. And the people who were hosting us were saying they were going to throw me a traditional Romanian birthday party. And for the day before my birthday, I seen them setting out a big barbecue grill, and that was good. And then the morning of my birthday, the party was at 8 o'clock at night, but at about 8 o'clock in the morning, they had set out all this meat to sit beside the grill all day. And it was about 35 to 40 degrees in Romania in July. So as you can imagine, the meat was in nice shape by 8 o'clock that night. And, and then they made me a cake, which was basically just fruit surrounded by whipped cream. And it sat out beside the, the meat all day. And come at night, I decided, I made the decision, I'm not going to eat any of this. So I ate just white bread and nothing else. But the rest of my teammates, they were very annoyed at me. And they were like, Robert, this is very disrespectful. You know, these people have put a great effort into your, your, your birthday. And they want you to join with them. And I was like, look, I'm sorry, I just can't eat it. But the, every other one of them got food poisoning. Except me. So uh, I had a stash of digestive biscuits and they were glad of them. <laughs> after... But isn't it hard to rely on other people? That's, just, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's so, so hard when you're trying to rely on other people. But we are being prepared for service here even today. We hear God's word. We talk to him in prayer. We, we come to church. We, we spend time together. We read his word. We learn about the importance of God's word the power it has, and the changing effect that it can have on each one of our lives. 
God's word is, is like a training, manual, a training manual for life. It contains guidance and instruction, the Ten Commandments. It, it tells us of laws which we live by, rule by, rules by which were set in stone, literally. Rules that people who don't even believe in Jesus, who have never entered a church door in their life, would still follow most of them. Most people would, would believe the Ten Commandments in most of them. You know, the laws and countries have actual governments which are based on some of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. What happens if we steal? Yes, we disappoint the Lord, but we also will go to jail. So a lot of God's teaching is backed up by rules. It teaches about morals, marriage, conflict, and strife. It tells us how we should strive to be in the, the fruits of the Spirit, how we will develop as people when we trust in the Lord. We will develop love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, temperance, and self-control. They will grow in us. But the Bible contains the most important message of all, that we need to receive salvation that we need to accept Jesus in our hearts as our Savior. And when we do that, we need to be able to do it. But when we do it, we will then be really blessed by Jesus' preparation. Then he will really start to prepare us to be servants of him. We need that relationship. Because if we don't have that relationship, we can't take that step deeper. Psalm 38, sorry, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. God, God's word gives us advice for every situation, whether it be good or bad. Whether we be having times of joy or times of pain, it gives us very clear, insightful teaching. Simple teaching. But we need to remember that God's word is, is not just one text. It is many texts written over many years by many various people. And it's not all brought together by chance. It wasn't just someday you opened a, they opened a, a temple in, in biblical times and people came in and, well, there's Genesis, and we'll, sure, we'll set Exodus on top of that. Then what's next? Oh, we'll put in something in Leviticus. This was brought together by God. This was not brought together by man. This was brought together by God. It's not by chance. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And that lovely verse moves us on to our next point. The presage or the warning that Jesus gives his disciples. Sometimes I like my points all to begin with the same letter, so I use presage, but then I've realized I didn't know what it meant. Maybe some of you didn't know what it meant, so it's warning is what it means. So Jesus warns them. He says in verses 10 and 11, he says, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. If any place will not receive you and will not listen to you, then shake, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Jesus is teaching the disciples a very important lesson for their ministry. And it's something that is so applicable to us, even here in 2024. How to deal with rejection. How to deal with people who won't listen to you. Jesus tells them, he says, stay there until you depart. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart. And what does that mean? Stay there until you go. Of course, that's literally what he's saying. But what it actually means, what the warning means is take as long as you need to help the people understand. St stay there until the people understand the message. Stay there as long as it takes them to hear and understand the message. But then there's a warning. He gives them th this presage, this advance warning to be ready for rejection. If a place doesn't accept the teachings of the of the if the, if the place doesn't accept the teachings, if the people don't heed the message, Jesus tells them to shake off the dust of their feet as a testimony against them. So the disciples were going from town to town, village to village, home to home, with this love in their heart, with this, this fervor in their heart, with this enthusiasm in their heart for other people to know the Lord. And I'm sure we, we've seen that, you know, we're enthusiastic. They're, they're, they're young Christians, they're wanting to go out and see other people saved. And Jesus is telling them, don't take it to heart if people don't listen. Don't become crestfallen. Don't become downhearted. 
Shake off the dust of your feet. In other words, forget about it and move on to the next. You have done your bit, but it's okay. The Lord is in control of the rest and move on to the next, not to let it affect them. During COVID uh, 2019, just before I would have started coming here to preach during your vacancy, I, I work at Greenmount Agricultural College and there was no students, so we, didn't, we had nothing really for us to do. So I was given a job of ringing farmers. About 450 farmers were divided up between some of us. We were given their numbers and told to ring them to see how they were getting on through lockdown, to see how they were coping. And that really, for me, was a great, uh, a great task to get when it came to dealing with rejection. Because whenever the Department of Agriculture phones a farmer, they're never really warmly accepted. Even though, especially when in the middle of a global pandemic, I was asking them, and they didn't really want to hear from me. Not only that, you know, I was asking them how they were. What do you want? Why are you ringing me? What are you looking for? What, the department never rings to give us anything good. And then, not only that, did they tell me they didn't want to hear from me, they continued to tell me all their problems, how they didn't like the government, the, the price of supplies was going away up, the weather was bad. Well, the weather was actually too good, that was the problem, it was far too dry for them. They needed a bit of rain. But that was a good lesson in resilience. Even though I was only doing what I was told, I was only trying my best for them, they didn't see it that way. And as Christians, that is how, as Christians, we will inevitably face that sense of rejection in our life. It might not be as pointed as a farmer hanging up the phone on you and telling you to go away. Or the reaction that Jesus got from the, the people in his hometown when he was preaching to them. The last time I was here, we looked at how we can be rejected and by, be criticized by those who are closest to us. Because those who are closest to us, those who love us and those who we love, will be honest with us. They will not pretend. They will be truthful when they're giving us their feedback. But even when we tell others about God's love, his message of salvation, we will face rejection. Even when we try to live for God in this selfish and sinful world, we will face rejection. Perhaps you've been in a situation where you've been in work and a group of colleagues stop talking whenever you enter the room because they're talking about something that you as a Christian might not like. Or they never invite you to go out for lunch with them because, oh, Christians are no fun. It's easy in an environment like this where we're all here with one thing in common. We're all here to worship God. We're all here to hear about his love and his word. And I'll go to the door in about 20 minutes, only joking, 10 minutes, and shake hands with you and you'll say nice things like good morning it's good to see you enjoyed your message and don't don't no, don't, don't not do that but realistically in life when we go out of the confines of a church setting whenever we go into the world that we live in we will face pointed rejection john 15 verse 18 says this if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first don't become downhearted if you feel cast out. Don't become crestfallen if your family or, or friends are, are treating you in a different way because of the beliefs you hold and the, the faith you have in the Lord. We are to love as Christians. The, the Bible tells us to love. The Lord tells us to love. And don't let people's ignorance to the gospel or ignorance to you as a Christian affect you. Keep positive. And remember that God answers prayer. Remember that he answers us when we call to him. Yes, it might not be instantly. Yes, it might not be the prayer that we, the way that we hoped our prayer would be answered, but God always answers us. He will always answer us. So continue to pray for those who you love. Continue to pray for those who you hold dear and that you care for. But he offers a, a warning a very, very stark warning for each person who is gathered here today. For those who, who don't trust in him. For those who reject him and his teaching. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of God and from the glory of his might. God warns us that if we reject him, 
if we don't trust in him, if we don't accept him as our own, we are facing a lost eternity spent in darkness in the place the Bible calls hell. But that's not something that one of us has to face because as we move on to our final point today, God's word is proclaimed. God's word isn't something that is alien to us. Uh, The disciples proclaimed it, even though it wasn't always received, even though the people didn't always listen, even though they had to shake off the dust of their feet as they went on. The disciples, even to this day, still faithfully proclaim God's word. In verses 12 and 13, So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons, and anointed many with oil who were sick, and healed them. They told people they had a need for a saviour, the need they had to turn away from their sin and to trust in the Lord. They were ministering God's word. They were healing people's hearts and they were casting out demons. They were saving people and helping those who needed them. And that is still relevant to us in 2024. We are still called to do the very same. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Psalm 96, verse 3, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among the people. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We are called, if we know God, if we have trusted in him, to spread his word. He is living inside us, it will be something that we will want to do. If God is inside us, we'll want to tell others about him, his love, his care, and his goodness for us. And as we grow as Christians, we will want others to know that feeling of peace and joy and assurance that we have in our hearts. But remember, we're not doing it in our own strength. We're not going out here with a burden on our own shoulders because if we trust in him, he will do it. God will guide us and lead us through life. He will put us in the places he needs us to be. And remember, use your Bible as an instruction manual for life. Talk to each other. Grow together as a congregation. Talk to God in prayer. Hear his message. It is our privilege. Don't be afraid or ashamed of the faith you hold. Be proud of it and encourage others to embrace it. But maybe you're here today and perhaps you're, you're still a stranger. You've never trusted in God or maybe you did at one point in your life but circumstances have changed and you've fallen off the path that God has laid out. It's not too late. Consider where you stand but don't reject his teaching. Don't be like the people that Jesus is warning the disciples about. We are being prepared here today because God's word is being proclaimed. We have been prepared by it week by week, year by year, hearing it taught. We have been warmed of the consequences of rejecting God's word. And as his word is being proclaimed today, and it will be in weeks to come, don't delay, don't be afraid, give him the glory. Ask him into your heart, and he will save you for all of eternity. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you, we thank you for the simplicity of your word, that you prepare us, you warn us, and that as we proclaim it and hear it proclaimed, that we can trust in it even today, that we don't have to delay, we don't have to do anything other than simply trust in you to have our sins forgiven and our path to eternity made clear. For we pray these things in the Savior's precious name. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing number 242 in the hymn books, number 242, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.